Welcome back to Troubled, a podcast by survivors of institutional abuse for survivors and the general public. Um, hey guys, Woo, how have you been? Enough, none of that okay shit. What does okay even mean? If anybody knows the etymology of this colloquial okay, please email us at thetroubledpodcast at gmail.com. This has been a lifelong query of mine in particular. It's Miranda tuning in from off the grid in Texas. Um, Super stoked to have Liz Ionelli back with us. Liz is my big sister from the Family Foundation School, my personal mentor uh, and confidant and someone who's kept me literally alive for better or for worse, you know, how... I may feel about that sometimes, but we wanted to get a ton of updates for you guys. There's been a ton going on in the survivor community, uh, and a lot of you are involved in that. And those of you who are not yet, we want to make sure that you have action items and updates. Also, just kind of want to chit chat about, uh, you know, our particular rabbit hole of reality. So here we go. Uh, here's Liz Ionelli. Oh, yeah. Her, her accolades, you guys. Real quick, real quick. Liz is a New York licensed social worker, traumatologist, psychotherapist. She represents survivors and speaks to our particular form of predatory social psychological abuse on trial in court extravaganzas across the country. And uh, she is a survivor of the Family Foundation School in Hancock, New York. And uh, we'll get more into it. So, yeah, no, really back into it. You guys, it's been it's been fucking real. All right. Love you. All right, Liz. Um, I am so stoked that we actually get an opportunity to sit down in the same audio space at least and catch up because it's been a really long while. I know there's been a lot going on in everyone's lives, including our own. So you're welcome. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I, you know, in my world, it's been great out in Texas. um, But you actually were in Texas for a minute. You want to fill people in who haven't heard from you since like uh, episode yeah, eight? Yeah, I've actually been um, deployed uh, working at COVID field hospitals, and I was most recently located um, in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas on the Mexico border. So I'm back and done um, with my deployment. So now I'm home and kind of returning to my original front line, which is uh, taking down the troubled feed industry for what they are. Okay, so speaking of the front lines, the first front lines where our heart and soul is, uh, there's been a lot of updates since episode eight when we had Liz. If you guys haven't heard it, check it out. But we really focused on the New York Child Victims Act, um, and a lot has happened in the last few months. So can you update our listeners as to what's going Uh, on Sure. So the Child Victims Act came into effect on August 14th of 2019, which extended the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse cases. Uh, During this look back period, survivors uh, can file or could file a civil case against their abusers and or institutions that may have enabled the abuse um, or been negligent um, in allowing the abuse to happen. Uh, But no matter how old they are now or how long ago the abuse happened, they still have this look back window. Um, After years of opposition before this was passed, principally from religious organizations, the enactment of the CVA Child Victims Act reflected and acknowledge the reality that many victims require years, if not decades, to come to terms with their childhood abuse and to seek accountability, myself included. Um, The Child Victims Act also, um, for the first time, recognized that childhood sexual abuse is not harm that ends with childhood, but frequently causes grievous harm to victims throughout their lives. Uh, Because of the reduction in court services due to the coronavirus itself, Uh, The window has been extended for an additional five months until January 14th of 2021 to ensure that survivors have the access to the courts that they need to file a claim and get the long deserved uh, overdue justice uh, that is owed to them. Um, And that came that statement came directly from Governor Cuomo. So there's been a five month extension um, for survivors Uh, At the moment, the law has been passed in New York state only. We're hoping to set precedent for other states who have uh, not so great uh, statutes of limitations. Uh, Previously to the Child Victims Act, uh, claims have been extinguished five years after their 18th birthday. 
Um, like many survivors, if you had caught up with me five years after I turned 18, I still was very unclear as to what exactly happened to me and or if it was abusive and or was I really going to talk about it. So that kind of took that off the table. Um, so there has been an extension. So if you are um, a survivor of sexual abuse, that it had to have occurred in the state of New York, but you do not have to currently reside in the state of New York. So you just need a New York attorney to be able to file your claim and you have five extra months to do that. That's a lot of stipulations. Um, I, you know, I've said it a million times. I feel like it's very unfair to put this burden on those who were abused specifically in that way. Um, but if we can get a whole floodgate to open with these claims and these cases, is there like, what is the next step? What, is, what do people in other states do? Is there a way to try to initiate this kind of activity? Um, where they yeah, are? it's really writing to um, your local congressmen, senators, pushing for legislation, demanding that the uh, Child Victims Act, which was written for New York specifically, is written for their state specifically. They, uh, New York is really setting a precedent, uh, recognizing that the uh, time frame for a survivor of sexual abuse to come forward is delayed. And so they can advocate with that. And there are cases on file. Most of the Child Victims Act uh, was mainly focused on the uh, religious organizations like the Catholic Church. Um, and the Boy Scouts, but there was this one category that we were kind of the unsung um, category, which was the troubled teen industry. We were kind of like uh, the bad news bears that came out of left field. They didn't really <laughs> expect us, um, but we've arrived and we're here. And there are cases on file in the state of New York. Uh, my case was the first to be filed on August 14th, I believe at 4.28 p.m., um, the first day that it could be filed. So if you want to look up my case, go to eCourts, pop in my name, Elizabeth Ionelli, and you can uh, read my summons and complaint. And uh, you can read their denial, too, of the accusations and kind of follow along. But for my program, which I went to, the Family Foundation School, there are at least 10 cases of sexual, brutal sexual assault um, on file or on deck to be filed. And we're just one program in the state of New York. There are multiple Right. And our program, because I am also from the Family Foundation School, spanned over three decades. Um, and so are all of the generations of our program being represented um, right actually, now? Actually, yes. Uh, there are cases from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. They closed in 2014. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'm under some limitations, but let's just say that there are cases from beginning to end that are currently on file. Yeah. And the, the different generations. So this has been something we definitely want to touch on, assuming everyone, assuming everyone is familiar that the This Is Paris documentary dropped the other day. Um, this has been long awaited for in the survivor community. It was supposed to launch in May um, and it launched this week. And Paris herself is a survivor from Provo Canyon, which if you're familiar, Provo Canyon is where Robert Litchfield started. And he's the guy who started Wasp. Fuck that um, guy. And so... <laughs> Fuck, Fuck that, guy. that guy. And just to be very clear, because people like to pretend like Wasp is closed. None of these programs are closed. Robert Litchfield himself is currently personally involved in the trouble teen industry right now. And so is his brother Narvin and all of the other players in Wasp. Um, and so I'm really stoked that they brought Provo Canyon back up and looked back at the 90s yeah. again, um, because I'm cons you know, I, the conversation, at least in the social media sphere on TikTok, is very my generation, Generation Z. I hate terms. I hate labels, guys. But, you know, it's from that focal point, And there's a lot of people decrying this. Nobody's speaking about it. But, like, I just want to take a pause, you guys. There are years and hours worth of advocacy from survivors um, back from the 90s. And it's all over YouTube for the congressional testimonies from 2007 to 2009 um, and beyond and everything that Sia did and Cafferty did and all of this, it's very important. And Elon, come on, you guys, like we got to really give some respect and where, and credit others. where it's due. Yeah. I mean, they've been, they've been preaching this from the hilltops when no one was listening for decades. Um, and so I'm glad that we can kind of have like everybody at the table at once for a big right. dinner right now. And I think right that now. it's really a serendipitous uh, event that um, with breaking code of silence that 
just, you know, learning of how the connections were made. Um, and I have to admit, like, I'm an idiot. I had no idea until I watched the documentary. I mean, I'd read some stuff, but for Paris to have been uh, gone through Provo and to re-up with um, survivors and breaking code of silence, I couldn't have been happier to see those two merge. Um, and I, I think that um, everyone that's on the forefront, whether it's the ICU survivor campaign, breaking code of silence, uh, you know, all the different kind of, I don't want to say hunger games, but sectors of advocates and a activists that are out there. Um, kudos to us for, for speaking up. And I think that this is a really great platform that just got launched for all of these separate uh, groups with the same intent to really step forward into the light out of the darkness and to summon the troubled teen industry to the table. Um, and I've always said, if the tables won't turn, you know, you flip them the fuck over. And that's really, I think, what we're doing. And I, I just kind of want to say um, about the documentary, many of you may have read the open letter that I wrote to Paris um, online. And I, I think that some of it, I, I kind of have to step back for a minute and kind of say I'm sorry because I, I judged the celebrityism, if that's even a word, against the reality of what we go through. And, and I'm definitely guilty of that. And my fear was that this was going to be some, you know, uh, celebrity glitter bombed kind of lightly touched upon subject. But really, it was like the gateway to gaining a tremendous amount of discussion and open forum and to see other survivors coming together. Um, and I, I, Paris, if you're listening, I, I learned a lot about you, which I hope everybody did. Um, and I don't mean to sound long winded, but uh, I did not really have any idea. I mean, I'm not a celebrity. I, I live a regular life and I really got a, a good look into the tremendous pressure that you were born into. Um, and if, uh, without any offense, you know, just being born into the family that you were, we don't get to pick that you were pretty much already born into a program where your, your looks, your affiliations, you know, etiquette classes, all of these things, the pressure that was put upon you already to not be your authentic self, and then have to be shoved into these programs and further stripped of your self-identity, I can't even imagine what that's like. I mean, I came from a family that was image-driven for sure, but, but we weren't the Hiltons, you know. We were just a suburbia family um, that cared about if their daughter wore black nail polish, you know. Um, so I think in that regard, um, I, uh, I, I really relate to a lot of the things that um, you went through and, and just, I mean, the list goes on, you know, and I hope that you and I Paris eventually when all the settles down could have a conversation about it because I, I, I see you as a survivor now. Um, I don't see you as a celebrity that has like a survivor caveat or caveat to their existence. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. I think that uh, I, I hope that what a lot of people take from this, um, not only just looking at how trauma can really affect and form a, a facade of a presentation of someone, a projection of self and personality, is that uh, this whole classism jazz, you know, we were on Twitter and people are like, well, uh, that sucks for her. But, you know, paraphrasing, I don't really feel bad because she's super rich. I just <laughs> want to be very clear um, our friends are dying right now during COVID. Like we're not okay. Like I don't have running water or electricity. I'm broke. I had to wait for grant mental health therapy. That's not really kicking it. And my friends are literally dying. Okay. So yes, would access to resources be fantastic and life-saving for people in our situation? Totally. But just because somebody has money or the access you would think to these resources, number one, doesn't mean that they're even in a position to use them because looking at the situation that she's in by trying to like build I mean, that's brand and in really itself, solidify right this. There. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know what I mean? Like this, this woman is like dealing with our nightmares on a daily basis. She's put it in a public 
in, a, in this public way that she's going to get judged off at the same way that we're getting judged off at our Thanksgiving dinners with our families who her sister literally said in this documentary, no shade, you guys, no shade, like my sister and I and your sisters and you guys have had your issues with the, have you apologized to mom and dad yet? They went through hell. Like I was physically nauseated in that moment. That was the moment where I was like, oh, Paris, like I've literally been here. Like this is the, until my sister started listening to my podcast and her super uh, search the internet geeky husband was like, no, no, it really was abusive. This is exactly how my family Christmas dinners have gone for a decade. You know, your life wouldn't be such a wreck if you'd finished your program. We, you know, sold a house to fund for you to be at the family school. Why won't you thank us and apologize for not staying? Um, and as far as her mom, not knowing the abuse that she went in with Provo with everybody in these, uh, circles, understanding Synanon and those political affiliations and the money, I don't believe it for a second. I think she knew exactly what was happening to her daughter. Um, and I think Paris knows that, and that this is a, for her to step up publicly and put her family in a position where they now have to support her courage and her mission instead of standing in the way, I think that. I think that the odds that she's up again, regardless of her financial resources, um, I think that's pretty tough. Like, I don't envy her at all. Yeah, I me too. And then I look at it very similarly, and, and I'm thinking to myself watching this, and I'm like, oh, my God, like, can this girl ever escape? I mean, you know, she's work-driven, brand-driven, but then at nighttime behind closed doors, she's either having nightmares or not sleeping. And I'm thinking to myself, like, duh, me too. Like, all of us are, you know, like we're Paris and, and us live different lives, but we all suffer the same and, and trauma does not discriminate. It doesn't matter how much money is, is in your pocket and it doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, your status or what your last name is. Trauma affects every, it, it doesn't pick and choose who it destroys. It, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's like cancer. It just, it eats you alive you know, from the inside out. And my heart broke when I looked at the circle for Paris that she's in because she's really trapped in this, this alternate, you know, I look at her coming out swinging like a windmill that she was going to, you know, I really admire her ambition to create all of these things, but it's on a different scale, but it's the same way that I have, you know, repeatedly gone back to school and I can't have enough degrees and I can't, you know, nothing will ever be good enough for me. For me, it's, I mean, I wish I was driven more by money, but I'm, I'm driven more about making my mark and what's my legacy and what are, what am I teaching my children and what am I doing to save the lives of other survivors and, and things in that nature and giving people a platform to be heard. So I think that, you know, um, having to balance that plus suffering until now silently that's just tragic. Um, and, and I won't have it. And Paris is just as much a part of the survivor community as any of us are. Um, and I applaud her for coming forward. And, you know, in my open letter, I, I said, you know, you're probably going to lose some friends or people aren't going to understand you, or they're going to say, why are you, you know, same things they've said to us, why air your dirty laundry? Why put yourself out there? why, you know, you know, damage a brand or whatever. I mean, I don't have a brand to damage, but that's pretty respectable um, coming from me. And I think that I uh, was quick to speak to her in my open letter, really based in fear, like kind of like, Hey, listen, like, I hope this isn't going to be some kind of, uh, I, I, I don't know what I was, you know, I, I know how I was feeling, but it was really fear based. And now that I see it and I know kind of more of what she's going to on a day to day basis and the isolation you know, we were all put in solitary confinement at some point, And to some degree, I think we all still kind of live in that space sometimes. Yeah, uh, that's a beautiful point, Liz, per the gilded cage. I think that people see um, pretty flashy things and they don't understand a gilded cage is still a cage. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I feel like most of us are, or at least not most of us, I'll speak for myself personally, there is a part of me consciously that is still 100% still trapped at the family. Yeah, I always say, you know, we left the program, but the program hasn't always left us. And that's the burden we carry. Um, and that that essentially is the code of silence, because we don't want people to know 
what we're carrying inside because for decades, you know, since we've been screaming at the top of our lungs, we've been told that we were lying, manipulating. We've been told that we have, you know, no business speaking about the past, shut up and move on. We did the best we could, you know, like we've been shut down over and over and over and over again on like a real life level. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to have that kind of public eye on you and having the bravery to then step forward beyond that and say, okay, well, yes, my name is Paris Hilton. And yes, this is where I come from. And this is my last name, but that does not define my trauma. And my trauma is no less valid than anyone else who has gone through a similar experience. And that, that right there, that is courage and bravery at its, its most purest form, in my opinion. I agree. I think that there's something incredibly necessary about claiming our own story so that it can no longer be used against us. Yeah. And, you know, that's definitely why I think podcasts like this exist. Again, I go back to all the different groups and sectors. I hate to use that word, but all of these different uh, pooling of resources and programs, there's definitely uh, a, a vibration that's palpable, like thunder, you know, like horses thundering up over a hill. You can hear us coming now because we've all through social media, the internet. I mean, I'm, I'm a nineties kid. You're a nineties kid. We didn't even have internet. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I remember the first time I sat down at a computer literally and I typed hello, like, and I didn't get a response. I didn't even know what to do with it. Um, so like, that's where I come from, you know? So um, I'm 41 now, um, but, you know, computers were not, and social media certainly was not um, a big thing or platform. And I think that we've used our ninja skills over time. And that's what we need the younger generations for, because, I, you know, being an OG, it's like, hey, I, I need you guys to help me whip up this TikTok or help me with Insta or whatever these things are, you know, like we really need to look. Genera generationally at what our skill sets are and combine forces like X-Force from Deadpool, best mo movie ever, and and really kind of come up with our own Marvel team and really um, kind of congeal all of our talent and all of our voices and our pain uh, together to really push this forward so that people have no choice but to listen and hear us and see us so that we're no longer invisible. Well, speaking to that, Avengers, it's time to assemble within <laughs> your districts and with all the other districts. Uh, your challenge, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to, like, seriously, this is an open secret. The reason that the mass for-profit legal child abuse system that began with the assimilation of the indigenous, which for the record, assimilation is still happening, indigenous peoples are still being targeted through the states, funneled through these programs, they did it with Elon. They're still doing it through the tribes. This is happening today, you know, all the way to the cult spawn, tough love, trouble teen industry, which we're from, from America's most dangerous cult, Synanon. This is one of the biggest backdrops of American history. This is how America deals with the commodity of its children and specifically with children who either represent a cultural identity that is counterintuitive to oppressive colonial mindsets of subjugation and get in line to soldiers turn against each other now you know if you like liz said like myself wore black nail polish or black lipstick or listened to rock and roll and i know, still do p.s just saying <laughs> p.s you guys saying these right <laughs> right so like those are the kids and and those are those are the people that break the molds break the cycles stop this stuff so if that's you and you're ready and you're comfortable to speak up about this and add your voice to this cacophony of survivors being like enough is enough because reminder, you guys, the cost of this isn't just our own nightmares, which for the record, the world is all about me. And those are very fucking real. Number one. Number two, it's not about our friends who are literally just, you know, just dissolving in the daylight and turning into some sort of cemetery of like, please, not me yet, not them yet, who's next? This is literally, that's a cost too. But there are children like Cornelius Frederick, the 16-year-old foster child in Kalamazoo, Michigan, that was murdered for throwing a sandwich on camera with no justice. There's Martin Lee Anderson, Aaron Bacons. There are children dying in these programs right now. Mm -hmm. And it is not going to stop. People can, oh, it's not going to stop. 
unless we break this open secret, this weird hypnotic like collective complacency that collectively gaslights survivors and trauma, like people who are suffering from this trauma now. Um, so if you want to jump on, there have been multiple Speak Your Truth campaigns throughout the years. Um, this breaking code silence that Liz keeps mentioning. This was started by WASP survivors a few years ago. Please hop on YouTube so that you can see, you know, the long testimonial forms. That's where ICU survivor is also. Uh, you get the long testimonial forms that people have been uh, publishing on their own, just hashtagging it so that it's searchable from their own accounts. If you're not comfortable hosting your own testimony because you would like some level of anonymity, which how is there that in social media anyways now if you're going to put your face on it, but you can uh, submit it to the ICU survivor campaign or you can submit that to Breaking Code Silence. So Breaking Code Silence is also on all the social media. They're a group of WASP survivors that have come together to try to really brand this version of the mission and push it forward. Um, so definitely connect with them, make your pictures. That's something that's covered in the documentary as well. You'll see Paris and her friends from po Provo participate in that. And that's right. been, you know, those have been released on the internet. Um, and so that's the way to get the voice out. Also, per Liz's TikTok, I see you survivors at 42 million views on TikTok right now, you guys. So and I don't even uh, know what that means. I know it's cool. <laughs> and that's why Miranda is my internet, so cool. is like my internet ninja because you know, I'm interviewing for, for my Marvel internet and social media team. Obviously I am not as savvy as I would like to be. Um, my wheelhouse is in a totally different category. Um, and, uh, I think, and, and, and again, and if Paris, if you're listening or any, any survivor out there that's listening, um, who, you know, doesn't know, or doesn't, uh, have anybody yet or whatever. And I'm not plugging myself in any way. Like I don't make money off of survivors period. Okay. Just so that's known. Um, but I am a psychotherapist and I'm a traumatologist and a troubled teen industry expert. I provide expert court testimony on behalf of survivors. I'm a consultant for law firms. Um, I provide therapy to survivors exclusively so if you are looking for a therapist, um, and Paris, that includes you, and I will treat you like a survivor, um, like everybody else. And um, open, open door, open invitation to reach out to me if you're having difficulty or looking for someone that has been through a program. And, you know, uh, I guess that's my, I don't mean to sound, I want to say brand, but th that's my superpower. And that's what I'm good at. Um, because I understand both sides clinically of what's happening. I've been through it myself. I've dealt with my trauma. I deal with my trauma. I suck at it sometimes too. Um, but I'm not perfect. I mean, like I wrote, I lay in rowboats and cry because I like to be alone um, a lot of times. And that's the only way I can be alone with three boys and a dog and a house full of people. And um, so uh, that, that's what I can offer the, the community um, for myself. Um, and I, I just, I think that finding the right venue to be heard matters and connecting with other survivors really matters and keeping our own trauma in check. Many of us are now in our late thirties, early forties, and still haven't begun the journey. We've just black boxed what happened to us and it kind of comes crashing out eventually. And it will, it's, it doesn't stay in there forever. Um, and so to try and kind of preemptively put a strike out against it is really way better than dealing with the aftermath, which as we know, um, the alternative is, is suicide sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, so for survivors who do want to take you up on that, because I myself personally did, how can they get in contact with you? I see you survivor at gmail.com. Do it, you guys. So this is going to make Liz really uncomfortable. So Liz, you can just walk away for a second, but, um, the whole reason that this podcast exists or a big reason why I'm still alive is because a couple years ago, Liz I'm organized. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm I know. Uncomfortable. I know. Walk away. Walk, walk away. away. Um, she organized the New York Times cover about our school, which was it's like who's next. And it was about the suicide rate at our program, which for the record, during COVID, we're losing alumni from my program once every two weeks. Literally, literally my program alone that doesn't speak to the alarming death rate at Agape boarding school for boys, by the way, you guys, which we're about to get into in the coming weeks. But 
So when she was organizing this, this kind of stuff triggers people. And I think that this documentary coming out as well, some people are also going to be triggered um, by that. But the article about our school and the response from the public saying that, of course, these kids are killing themselves. They were troubled anyways. Um, and then the survivors turning on each other because some are ready to deal and some aren't um, was incredibly life altering for me. Um, my life completely had to be dismantled. I left the corporate world, um, finally got into therapy after over 15 years and was actively suicidal, like during this process. Um, and so this has forced me to get involved. Um, there's a lot of us that when our own abusers come out on the front pages of the fricking New York times or on social media, it forces us to deal with our own shit or die. Literally. Those are the options that we have. Um, but there were times when I couldn't see straight and I was driving out of being gaslit and ganged up on by a gaggle of bitches at work. And I just couldn't handle life. And my parents were blaming the, my not being able to handle life on me, not finishing the program, um, which they did still do, I guess we just don't talk about it. And, uh, the only thing I could do was pull my car over and, and call Liz. Um, and that line always got answered and I'm still here and I don't really want to be here all the time, but it's support systems like literally Liz in my life. That is why I am and why we're doing this work. So if any of you guys have gotten anything out of us doing what we're doing, or this has helped you inspired you to do something um, and join the freaking Avengers team. Like, I just want to say, like, I know she doesn't appreciate this and this is a I humility have a hard time thing. taking compliments. We'll just put it at that. Me too. I me mean, don't we all you guys. And I just want to like give a little respect to that because here's the deal. We were like social psychology, brainwashed compliments are fake compliments are part of brainwashing to me. They're a manipulation and that's it. That's where it ends. And um, so, yeah, we should be uncomfortable with compliments. It's okay. Yeah. Well, and to speak to that and to speak to suicide and to speak um, our own truth, I'm going to, if I, do we have time? I, I just want to take, Please. I want to take the opportunity to be vulnerable. Um, people will ultimately find this out. I mean, I'm eventually going to trial and I have chosen not to remain anonymous. Um, but as a part of my uh, story, I, I guess I'm going to read to you what, the I guess the index trauma there are multiple but just so you know more about me and I haven't been very in detail about and just trigger warning for anyone about to listen to this short segment I'm about to read um, about where I came from and and how I relate to other survivors and and what we all went through you know as being a kid of the 90s I'm just going to read to you uh, just a very short statement that I had to give um, recently about what happened to me at my program. And um, I say this and it's on file and I went first simply because I hope others will follow. And it's, it's a bittersweet thing because I, I wish there were zero on the docket, but I know that there are more victims out there. And I know that not all of us, um, like from the documentary when Paris indicated that staff had pleasure or got off on watching them shower. And like, I went through that too, you know, like that's not uncommon. And, you know, it, it just pulled me in to I was glued to my screen watching this documentary because I'm like, oh, my God, like, is, is there one place that didn't watch wash? Is there one place that did not watch a shower or invade our privacy and and, you know, beat the shit out of us and, you know, all these things. So I'm just going to read and then people can take away from it what they will. But this is like truth. Um, and this is my story. And this is why. I filed my case and this is why I'm coming forward and um, I'll just start right here. Um, okay. Pause for uh, firstly, you guys, this whole program is a trigger warning, but I'm actually going to cut this right now. And it's going to be a separate segment for those of you. Cause I know how intensely traumatic this is. So for people who really need to heed a uh, trigger warning on physical and sexual abuse of children, um, skip this next segment. Um. I was brutally raped in a walk-in freezer by a staff member at the family. When I finally had the courage to report it, it was dismembered and turned on me. I was falsely accused of having a consensual sexual relationship with a staff member. 
after being privately berated for hours by staff for making such an egregious allegation, I was made to stand in front of all staff and students and humiliated for hours for making my, quote, false claim. I was called a slut, I was called a whore, and I was called a liar. My punishment, nothing short of torture. I was wrapped in a wool blanket, duct taped at my ankles, my midsection, and my shoulders, not uncommon method of forcible compliance, and left face down in the boiler room, literally the boiler room, alone. Every day, the same staff member would come in and ask me if I was going to talk about the, quote, incident ever again. I was fed from dog bowls, oatmeal, or tuna fish. I was told that's what I deserved. And yes, I urinated, defecated on myself, and I had my period. Day eight, I finally broke. When asked again on day eight if I would ever speak about the incident again, I finally whispered with what breath I had left, no. I was then let out of the blanket. Days later, I attempted suicide in the very freezer that I had been raped in, laying completely naked and drinking what I thought was bleach. I turned out to, it turned out to be mislabeled vinegar, sorry. I'm glad that I did not die. At the moment, I was disappointed that I would be stuck in this place forever. If you had told me 25 years ago that someday that pain will, I'm sorry, this is hard for me still to get through, someday that this pain would be useful to help others, I would have laughed. So thank you for sharing that with everyone because I think that really uh, humanizes you and allows people to understand how much, unfortunately, they may have in common with you. Maybe. And I hope other survivors um, look at my story and hear it and hear others like Paris's and other survivors and everyone with Breaking Code of Silence holding up their posters. And for those who are tuned into the ICU survivor campaign and listening to those stories, that it gives some sense of, of community and that Everything the troubled teen industry wanted to do was to separate us, alienate us, dis- dismantle any kind of trust that we would ever have. They taught us that we were nothing, that we didn't deserve anything, and that we were unwanted and just unfixable. And so I, I violently argue that point back, that we deserve nothing but the best outcome in these situations and that we deserve justice that is long, long overdue. And we are not anymore speaking out alone. You are part of a collective and a survivor family that will not only shelter you, we will protect you. uh, We will organize, we will rally for you. We will show up to court for you. We will support you, advocate for you. If there's a need, we will find a way to fill it. I mean, we are the largest I guess, organized survivor crime family out there without committing the crimes that they were the ones, the crimes were committed against us, but we are extremely organized and extremely savvy and very resourceful. And we were, we were trained for this. Like when I look at COVID and quarantine (laughs) and all this stuff, like we were just, we were at summer camp getting trained how to survive. So we've already had the training. We have the doctorate and how to survive. Um, We just don't yet know how to thrive under these conditions. And that's my goal is that survivors eventually will turn their names into we are the thrivers of the troubled teen industry because we took a chance to turn the tables and we flip them over um, in our favor. So God help anyone out there working in the troubled teen industry, paying for the troubled teen industry, Uh, funding them, hiding them, sheltering them, Um, your days are numbered and we know your names. You may not remember ours, but we remember your faces. We know where you live. We know what you do. We know where you are. We know what you're up to. And, and you, the same tactics and the same things that you taught us, we're simply going to turn back on you, but we're going to use evil for good this time. And your days are numbered. Um, and, and that will always be my position. And I will not stop until they do. We're going to use evil for good this time, you guys. I love it. Uh, <laughs> also, I'm totally like my team is now the TTI Thrivers. That'll be um, my new favorite little t- like dodgeball team when we 
put that shit together. Right. Uh, I, I, I a hundred percent agree. Um, I've seen some amazing teamwork, especially with the circle of hope girls. I mean, the shit they've accomplished in less than six months, I believe it has been, is like getting all the girls removed. Uh, they've uh, raided the school. It's probably permanently closed. Uh, still got to get all that jazz going. Um, the Trinity Teen Solutions girl and now Solstice East is all coming together. Um, and that's incredibly inspiring. I, I feel like the fun part of them trying to convince us that we were completely alone, no one believed us and no one had our back, is that we actually have this kind of these super teams that are rising up together. Um, and it's been amazing. I do also though, uh, when we're like, Oh my God, survivors are so great. Like these are my girls. That's fucking true. You guys and come at them and I will literally rip your spine out your asshole and pick my teeth with it. And I don't even fucking floss. So I mean it. And, okay. And, and guys too, like girls are not the only ones that suffered. There are yes. plenty of men out there now that were boys at the time that were also abused. And I don't want them to be forgotten either. And however, you know, and those in conversion therapy, however people choose to identify gender wise, this we were children. And, and that's the bottom line. So if if, you know, anyone who abuses children, um, the troubled teen industry hires nobodies and makes them somebodies. And these are people mm. that get drunk on power and control and abuse. And the troubled teen industry is a magnetized forum that attracts strongly predators and pedophiles and power hungry, dysfunctional and, and distorted quote adults that were put into a position of power and, and um, forcible coercion uh, over children. So for that in itself, anyone is guilty by association for participating or not reporting or not standing up on their own when they saw these abuses and atrocities taking place. I, I hold you all personally accountable and if you have a truth to speak and you are one of those who are guilty, now's your time to try and beg for redemption because there's really not a lot of room for forgiveness. Not from me. And forgiveness for me, just so I can quantify that, forgiveness doesn't mean, and this is from Nadia Boltz Weber, it doesn't mean that I am saying what you did to me is okay. It's simply saying that I refuse I refuse to be chained to you in this trauma bond of the harm that you caused me. And I'm taking and wielding bolt cutters and releasing myself from my abusers and the pain that they cause so that I can go on to live my life, but they're still going to have to come to the table and face me in court and try and convince a jury that what they did was okay. And that's on them to try that. That's on them. My job is to tell my story and to tell it well and to be able to, I don't have to convince anybody what happened to me. I don't, I, I don't have to convince anyone. I just have to show up. I just need to show up in a court of law and I'm going to Supreme Federal Court for my case. I just have to show up and tell my truth and that's it. And in terms of civil cases, the preponderance of evidence, what that means is that a jury only has to be convinced 51% that the actual abuse took place. So God help the abusers that are going to have to sit and sweat across from me from when I take the stand and they sit at that table and see my face. God help them because they're, the reckoning is coming and they're going to have to answer for their crimes against humanity and their crimes against children. Amen, sister. I 100% support that. And I hope to see you all there. Front and center, baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was going to go from a BFF to bully segue because, of course, I wanted to do that before we gender fluided detoured. But I do want to go back to the gender thing really quickly. Um, Per your point about our brothers, this is something that seriously concerns me. Um, Since I've been involved in the survivor community, um, I've noticed that our brothers are underrepresented. And when I speak to my brothers, the guys that I know, um, there there's more of a shame, fear based model for them coming out and speaking and connecting to other survivors or going public. Um, There's also a 
huge uh, disproportionate access to and engagement in mental health services. Yes. And most of the survivors that we're losing right now from suicide, not overdose, not risky lifestyle, depressive behavior, but direct suicide are our brothers. Yes. And can you speak to that from a psychological perspective? Like what's um, going on? Yeah. Clinically, uh, males are more uh, likely to complete suicide, whereas females are more likely to attempt suicide and then eventually succeed. So that's just, um, that's the science. It's really simple. Um, and so with that being said, uh, you know, the suicides, if you look down the list and separate gender, if it was just straight male, female, which is unfair, but if you do it like that, um, roughly, roughly, I would say at least 60% of completed suicides are male, um, and the rest are female. And the methodology behind it, meaning the way that they commit the act, um, is, is very different between males and females as well. Well, I, that makes sense because as someone who just wound up in a coma after my best suicide attempt, which was what was used to validate any sort of placement in a program, even though it was a year later um, when I was sent to the family school, um, you know, the shame of surviving and then having to deal with everyone knowing what I did and thinking I did it for attention, even though let's be fucking clear, you guys, I got all the way to dead. Like I did get all the way to dead. It's just my sister woke up and then they pumped my tummy and put me in a coma. Um, I, I think that guys having to deal with all of that drama that surrounds surviving suicide is just even more mortifying than going on with life in the first place. Um, and then also I have a question for you again, as a psychological professional and a survivor, I was in pro, we were obviously in programs with men as well. And just to be very clear, if so, nobody was familiar with what attack therapy was for someone at the table, like us, uh, for a female, it was, you're a dirty fucking stupid, manipulative cunt slut. Nobody loves you. Your parents hate you. That's why you're here. The very best, if you don't work the program, is maybe you'll get raped a little on the street like the stupid fucking dumb whore that you are so you can pretend that you understand what love is. But eventually you'll finally die of drug overdose and suicide like it was always intended if you don't work the program. And while uh, that plays, even though none of that was true about me at the time and I totally supported myself at the time, a lot of that voice has become an internal attack that I deal with literally all day long, every single day. But for the males in my family, it was also very disturbing in its own particular way to watch what happened to them, which was very similar narratives, but it was very focused around, you're not a real man, you'll never be a real man, you don't know what a man is, blah, 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 and em emasculating these young boys during puberty around their peers and these females um, in this kind of a situation, I feel like a lot of the core drill of the attack went to the fundamental identity of these young men. Mm -hmm. And I feel, feel like because they don't, can't talk about it, they don't talk about it. They haven't had someone validated either as a peer or as psychological perspective. Um, I feel like that's more identity wise, earth shattering. And again, conversion, people that were dealing with any sort of that, that, that core identity, they didn't hit my core identity. They just ripped apart my personality and I built a kaleidoscope, you know, defense mechanism that I'm still trying to break free from now. Can you speak to that? Um, I, I agree with it. Um, and I think that the, the, the shame also too, that from some of the survivors that are male that I've, I've worked with, they carry a lot of guilt of seeing uh, female uh, survivors in their program being brutally attacked or being forced to take part in that because we were all uh, in the programs forced to be a victim, a witness, and a perpetrator of abuse simultaneously 24 hours a day. So for, for the men now who have, have grown up through this trauma, they witnessed terrible atrocities and a lot of them end up in, re in what I call rescue relationships where they want to rescue the female and then it fails. And then the, the females who went through this program have such a skewed view of men and what we deserve. Like I myself have engaged uh, in multiple very extremely abusive relationships, just like 
Paris had indicated, because we, we only accept to the, the level of what we think we deserve. So I, I think that for males and females, the issues are different, but shame is shame. And I think that we've all had to kind of come to terms with where we're at and look at our lives and, and look forward. And that's why, you know, therapy can be helpful to work through some of that shame and claiming your own I- identity back. It, it's really taking yourself back from the assholes that took it from you. Um, and, and that's really, that's, that's really what I, what I think. I agree. Well, and per the support community, back to my BFF to bully segue, because you guys, I never forget any of my like three million trains of thoughts that are happening at time because ADHD is a superpower and not a dysfunction. Anyways, anyways, um, as like a lot of us, we do support each other, but I myself am even guilty of participating in these program relationships that have been trauma inscribed on my false personality structure, you know, um, And I also wasted so much of my therapy going through screenshots of group chats or, you know, conversations with other survivors where I felt like fundamentally attacked because my core wound and I I hope I, I hope people I hope nobody relates, but I know you guys do, is that I feel like the entire world is rejecting me, putting me up on some scarlet letter platform, burn this bitch, witch down shit. And everyone around me, including my family, my loved ones, and myself, are validating that and listing in perpetuity the crimes against me. Um, And so when I have, especially with other survivors, turn on me and we always, we use this stuff like I've talked to everybody and they agree. Like everybody says you do this, Miranda, like blah. Um, I, that's my trigger. That is, that's totally my trigger. And, um, I know that you've spoken on it before, um, because of everything in the different generations of advocacy and in our attempts to support each other, where we've self-sabotaged that support system and the, uh, productivity that we could have had pushing the mission forward. So, um, right. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Uh, look, the bottom line is, is the programs, uh, they trained us to become, uh, emotional assassins, whether the gun was pointed at us or pointed at others around us. And that overflows into our daily lives. We, we were trained like pit bulls to attack each other and you weren't able to make friends or healthy alliances. You were not able to be afforded safety in relationships. Um, we're trained to attack and that, that rears its ugly head at the most unopportune times. And especially when someone um, criticizes us or points out something in us that, that triggers us and brings us right back to that place, we, we are trained to attack and we have to really unlearn that behavior, which takes time. Um, and I think that a lot of our relationships, whether it's with friends, your partner, spouse, whatever, a stranger, um, family members, whatever, we, we respond viciously um, and almost sometimes uncharacteristically of what we normally would have said if we were in a better space. So we have to recognize that they, they trained us to attack each other and that survivor on survivor attacking and or bullying or kind of uh, tensions or, you know, everybody wants to be first in line or whatever it is. Um, It's simply because we're all so desperate to be seen and to be heard. And it's difficult for us sometimes to share that space because we're all very protective of our own stories and of our own trauma and our own secrets. And I think that if we can try and shift towards looking at at survivors as kind of like X-Force or the Avengers or looking at us as a team... Um, our powerhouse uh, will really increase, I mean, like exponentially, you know, I think the time to um, merge and collaborate is now Uh, not saying everyone can't have their own respective corners or, or whatever, you know, I'm not saying I'm throwing sneakers up on a wire, but you know, I'm saying that only a kid from the nineties would know what I meant. Um, But (laughs) You know, I think that this is really, um, and especially with Paris coming forward, this really highlights the need for 
uh, kind of a, a massive uh, strike attack or a strike team to come together and pool resources and share information even bro- more on a broad scale and really collaborate to really, I mean, like, let's talk about hitting a home run. Like, we're all in the dugout, like, chomping, and we're all very activated and triggered and anxious for change. So now's the time to really make that platform even bigger and find a way to centralize all of our superpowers and really hit the troubled teen industry, you know, uh, the analogy. I mean, instead of kicking them in the balls, let's kick them in the bank account. You know what I mean? Like, that's really where where it starts. Um, and I, I say that uh, in the most, I guess, simplest way, way I can. But n- now is the time to collaborate and share resources um, and to to kind of team up and and really uh, design a team that is unstoppable. You know, the industry is huge, but we're bigger. There are way more of us survivors than there are abusers. So we should remember that and they should know that too, that there are for every one staff member that's out there, there are hundreds of us that remember them. So they should go to bed with nightmares. I would like to hand those nightmares back to them where they belong, because I I know for me, I can say I'm about to become a nightmare in uh, a few people's dreams and I would happily trade in mine um, and give them that as my parting gifts. Mm, I'm going to be right there with you, Freddy Krueger. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm like an evil genius, but and I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. I'm super cool with it because I'm also from the family school. And my first sponsor was Cindy Argyros, um, the redheaded little chihuahua she devil. And I've had a fantasy of standing in the courts of every dimension uh, beside you, redheaded stepchildren from multiple generations facing our abuser. Like they, they, they don't get to forget who we are, you guys. Like, and if you think they did, that's not for long. As far as the Avengers assembling, there's a lot that the coalition of different survivor groups um, have out there for you guys to get involved in. So I'm just going to spiel that real quick. Um, a, a group that we're heavily involved with, both Liz and myself, Freedom Village, the Freedom Village Experience. Uh, they're out in New York as well. Their program was closed down in New York as well. They've got the lawsuits going as well. I mean, you guys got to check this. They were human trafficking, sexually trafficking these kids out of Freedom Village. Um, and it's, you know, just dig into it. There's plenty of cases out there. Um, I think there was a girl as young as 10 that they were doing that with there. Uh, It's freaking horrible. So they've been like pretty amazing at putting together some teams. We're working with the National Youth Rights Association, Naira. Uh, There is a coalition-based COVID letter that's been out there since pretty much after COVID started because as you guys know, obviously they're not following COVID restrictions. There's no inspections. There's no regulations. Our last episode on Mingus Mountain, over 50% of the population of that girls program has covid you know uh and that is not the only one remember lakeside where cornelius was murdered again he had covid over 100 of them had covid come on let's stop playing with that so definitely sign those petitions and check out that open letter to congress and if you guys are part of any groups definitely add your seal of approval to that um to get that going and breaking code silence again Thank check them you. out breaking co- yeah breaking code silence.net they've got a petition up there are tons of petitions up Honestly, sign them the fuck all, you know, Uh, I mean, best case scenario, we all pull Excel sheets with all of our uh, specific authentic signatures and just compile them in the future. But sign that petition, get involved if you want to be involved with that. Uh, There's a picture social media campaign. And then there's also the videos on YouTube and social media. Make sure you hashtag it breaking code silence and check out the ones that have been up there for the past couple years. Um, And then ICU survivors been up there for the past couple years. I love YouTube for it because I prefer the lot. Like I made in the midst of my high suicidality depression, a like 26 minute horrific ICU survivor video. And, and there's ones from all over the world because institutional abuse is a global thing. Uh, It's just that other parts of the world have mental health access and also recognize the crimes of their past as uh, empty and shallow as it can be in the case with tomb the home in Ireland where there are still over 900 baby corpses in their sewers that they refuse to exhume because they don't 
want to compile a DNA evidence uh, database, but they do have a survivors of abuse com- uh, commission, which provides mental health access, housing and restitution to survivors. Of- uh-huh. <clears throat> All right. So I feel like we just meant to give people a really quick update. And um, I think we've given them enough to chomp on for a minute. What do you think? <laughs> I, th- I think so. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, uh, you can just email me. It- it's all word i see you survivor at gmail.com and i will get back to you as soon as i can all right you guys heard it avengers assemble it's time to take down the trouble teen industry let's go let's go